Walking along a path at the roots of Pike's Peak, you're wondering if you should be concerned about the cassowary bird in the bushes beside you. Taking a fork in the road past some spotted hyenas, you approach the Anselm Society Digital Pub. Inside, you find a raucous conversation on the arts, faith, and whether an elephant shrew is more elephant or more shrew. In the corner, you find three people. One of them is arguing that the killer whale is undoubtedly the coolest animal to ever exist. And that's me, uh, Matthew Melema, and welcome to Believe to See, a podcast of the Anselm Society Arts Guild. The Anselm Society is a coalition of churches across the front range of Colorado dedicated to one very simple goal, a renaissance of the Christian imagination. Uh, to find out more about the Anselm Society, please visit us at anselmsociety.org. And while you're doing that sort of stuff, why not rate and review us on iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts. Helps us out a ton. We really appreciate it. And let's bring in now our co-host for today, Evangeline Denmark. Evangeline, how are you doing? I am hanging in there. I am definitely in need of a little inspiration. So I am pretty excited to be on the podcast tonight and be talking to our guest. I am really excited too. And we'll, we'll get to the reasons why uh, very soon. But before we get going, Evangeline, me and you have a, a set of animals in our head based on the work of the artists that we're about to introduce. So like killer whales, cassowary birds, um, narwhals. Are there any that have always had a special place in your heart? Oh my goodness. Owls. I love okay. owls. So I'm pretty excited about that. Crows. You and I have had conversations about crows before. I think we're both crow fans or am I misremembering oh, and you are I terrified think... of crows? You don't I'm... like birds. Right? I am terrified of crows. I, I have a, I have a condition, uh, ornithophobia, <laughs> the fear of birds. Dozens right. of Americans suffer from it, but I think <laughs> dozens. objectively, <laughs> there are dozens of us. <laughs> dozens. Uh, but do you, do you have an online group support group? <laughs> that's not a bad idea, actually. But um, yes. when I, from a distance, I think crows are objectively fascinating because they're they're so smart. Like yes. they're almost they're basically as smart as monkeys. But they, yes. they're all around wherever we go. Their behavior is super interesting. Their group interactions. I love mm -hmm. observing them from a distance. Okay. And See, I like looking at them like right outside the car window, you know, if you're parked in a, a, a parking lot or something and there's a crow like hopping around and, and they're just so cool. But I agree. They're cool birds. Uh, Julian of Norwich. Um, yes. So, so, you know, we, we had her feast day recently. And she's always shown uh, petting a cat. Because uh -huh. apparently when she was, uh, you know, the, the anchoress in her uh, little convent, she recommended to other people that cats are really good companions for you to have when you're in that. And she specifically said that crows are bad companions, which huh. to me means she tried having a crow companion <laughs> with her, which I, I think kinda, is hilarious. I want to hear that story. I'm a fan of Julian of Norwich. So, you know, I would like to know that experience that turned her against our, our most interesting friends, the crows. <laughs> I feel like there's a short story there, Julian and the Crow. But, right. Um, but anyway, let's go back to our, our guest today. Um, I remember I was, I was included on an email with our guest and Brian Brown. He's talking about his art. And I scrolled down to the very first painting that he showed of his samples. And as soon as I saw that cassowary bird, there was like, yes, we yes. absolutely <laughs> need this guy on the pod. And I am so excited. Uh, Josh Thiessen, welcome to the podcast. We're so happy to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. So, uh, Josh, uh, you are a painter uh, from Canada, but before I don't want to give all the good info. Why don't we let you uh, just share a little bit about who you are, uh, where you're from and the sort of art that you do? Well, a little bit about my background. I was born in uh, Moscow, Russia, to uh, Canadian parents who were uh, professors and missionaries. And uh, I had a Russian nanny who did lots of arts and crafts with me from a young age. When we returned home to Canada, I was kind of discovered by a local hobbyist uh, wildlife artist. And she booked me for my first art exhibition when I was 11 years old. So I started very young. I was fortunate to be homeschooled for most of my elementary and high school years and, and graduated from high school when I was 16 and uh, went into art full time. And it kind of developed from there. I, I was able to get jury into 
these uh, international artist guilds, like the International Guild of Realism. And so that opened doors for me to start exhibiting my work in prominent galleries throughout the U.S. And uh, since then, I've been really blessed to go on to have solo exhibitions in, in galleries from New York to L.A. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. you're you're here in part because of your upcoming, uh, I mean, it's a book collection of your, your latest paintings, uh, Streams in the Wasteland. And listeners, I encourage you, while you're listening to this, like you can do this right now, go to Google, search Josh Thiessen, Streams in the Wasteland. You'll find some of the paintings on his personal site. You want to have these in front of you so you know what we're talking about. Then just order the book. It's really, really great. I reviewed it. I loved it. Oh, you should spell his name so people can know oh. it. The last name is T-I-E-S-S-E-N. That's right. That'll help optimize the Google search results. Let, yes. let me put it this way. Um, Josh very kindly sent us a PDF of his book so we could, you know, prepare for this podcast. And I, I opened it the other day. It's like, all right, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll skim through this, make sure I, I know enough to to have the podcast. I ended up reading the whole thing cover to cover, and I, I thought it was <laughs> fascinating. So you'll feel wow. the same way, listener. Get on the website, order the book. You, you'll thank me. Yep. But while the listener is doing that, Josh, maybe you could describe the, the sort of paintings that you do. Yeah, for sure. I create what I call hyper surrealist oil paintings. And so they're shaped, uh, which is a little bit unusual. So they're not, you know, usual rectangular or square shaped paintings, but they're all different kind of shapes. And uh, for my subject matter, uh, you kind of alluded to uh, uh, some of the, the animals <laughs> that I love. Um, I love that you like the cassowary and the, the ghost town. Um, I usually, you know, depict animals in unusual abandoned places. And kind of the overarching theme behind my work is the juxtaposition of the natural world uh, with human cultures. Yeah, so let's sort of get first impressions. Evangeline, I, I sent you the PDF for this as well, and we, me and you both really liked it immediately. What what struck you when you were just going through these paintings the first time? Just sort of broad picture. I um, Josh obviously describes his work <laughs> the best, but yeah, the juxtaposition. I always am interested in high contrast, especially in themes and content. And so it's just absolutely grabbing, you know, to see this cassowary is that how you say it bird i'm like looking mm -hmm. at it now but yeah cassowary you know in front of this old post office and to me there's so much life and death and decay in these pictures and that's so high contrast and that's i think something that we're really aware of right now coming out of this uh, year that we're that we've experienced where you know those the good and the bad is just so close up to us and so that's just what captured me about these images was hope amid obvious scenes of decay yeah absolutely and, and josh uh, just a couple other questions along those lines so you described it i think you said it was what was it hyper surrealist hyper realistic surrealist so what do you mean by let's sort of break that in half and ask what you mean what do you mean by your paintings being like hyper realistic and what do you mean yeah. by your paintings being surrealist yeah, yeah, good question. So, like, hyperrealism is a style of art that uh, kind of came out of the photorealism movement from several decades ago. More people in contemporary art now uh, use the term hyperrealism. And it's basically a very, very highly refined style of art. So, for my paintings, they can take up to 1,700 hours to complete. Oh my God. Um, <laughs> you, can, you can tell I have OCD tendencies, I'm sure. Uh, so basically, the one difference, though, than photorealism is that I don't just copy one photo. I use up to 30 to 40 photos as reference for each painting, mm. accompanied by, mm -hmm. you know, my experiences in the natural world and also concept sketches, which really start from the imagination and then um, work out from there. The surrealism element is something fairly new in my work. I would say really with this new painting series, Streams in the Wasteland, which I've worked on for the last six years, there's more of a suspension of uh, belief in my works. And uh, I love artists like Salvador Dali and just the, the spiritual and metaphoric meaning that can be conveyed. And so 
I've been surprised that my work has kind of been accepted by this pop surrealism movement that started out in California. And uh, yeah, I, so I kind of mashed the two terms into hyper surrealism. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, a couple questions along those lines about where your work sort of stands in the art world, because you have an introduction to your book that, that was really helpful. And in that introduction, you mentioned that, you know, back up until like, what, maybe like 1900 or so, wildlife paintings was considered a very legitimate subject for art. But then it sort of fell out of favor and maybe doing some. So how did wildlife paintings fall out of favor and what, what sort of happened to animals in the art world over the past century or so? Mm -hmm. It's a great question. So according to um, art historian David Wagner, he's like the world expert on animal art. And he has said that, you know, wildlife art was kind of the first bona fide style of art in North America. And so it was beloved by the public. You can think of artists like John James Audubon and mm -hmm. uh, his bird paintings. But in the early 20th century, uh, there was the pivotal New York City Armory Show, it was the international exhibit of modern art. And um, it imported a lot of the modern art styles all the rage in Paris at the time. And so uh, sadly, as a re result, uh, wildlife art kind of got kicked to the, the curb and even art museums started selling off their paintings um, and deaccessioning them. And so as a result, wildlife art kind of got disconnected from sort of the mainstream art world and ended up becoming sort of a subculture and so a little bit more focused on kind of naturalistic depictions of art, maybe a bit more illustrative. And so, yeah, that kind of gives you a little bit of a historical context. Yeah. So there's there's that element with what happened to animals. And there's the element where you are, you know, you representing things in your painting so it's not like it's not abstract it, it's it's not even real it's it's hyper real so putting those two elements together and seeing the success you had do you think there's been sort of a a resurgence of those two forms uh happening recently or what what's happened in the, in the art world <laughs> yeah so well from my vantage point I think the kind of resurgence in representational art and and beauty in general has has come by way of the postmodern movement. And for those who know a bit about art history, you know, Andy Warhol kind of was was very influential in kind of uh, blurring the lines between highbrow art and lowbrow art. He would, you know, place, you know, commercial objects like the Brillo box in an art gallery and it would be called art. And, uh, you know, people debate whether that's art or not, but kind of one of the ramifications of that was that things that were deemed as kitsch like animal art all of a sudden was deemed worthy to be in the art gallery and, and museum and so you know some of the top artists today are showing in top galleries but they're depicting animals in an unusual way where there's lots of irony like that's a real hallmark of postmodern art it, things that are done with uh, irony and, and narrative and story. So I wouldn't say like traditional wildlife art is kind of being accepted, but um, depictions in a new and different way. I think there's also um, even like philosophical reasons for why, you know, nature based art has has had more of a, a resurgence in the art world with kind of an emphasis on, on embodied uh, living and being connected to the earth as opposed to where in kind of the modern art movement, there is more of an emphasis on kind of finding some immaterial transcendent truth through like rationalism or idealism or, or inner feelings and emotions. I see now in the art world more of an emphasis on kind of lived experience. And I mean, frankly, uh, because of the sad state that we're in with the, the ecological crisis, I think, more and more artists are integrating environmental themes in their work. And so animals are, are much more welcome, I would say. Well, that's good. I, I will admit, I'm not the biggest Andy Warhol fan in general, but if he, his work somehow opened the door for animals to come back in the fine arts world, hey, good job, Andy. You, you did good work, dude. <laughs> um, that's a good thing. Yeah, so now let's go to uh, the Streams in the Wasteland uh, series in particular. And again, Listeners, I hope you're on his website right now looking at some of these images. 
let's start big. What, what was your general creative process for going about each of these paintings? Uh, so my creative process, like I mentioned earlier, starts with um, concept sketches. Oftentimes, I will think up an idea while I'm praying or, or reading scripture, and I have a little sketchbook on my nightside table in case an idea comes to me. And so from there, um, the sketches can stay in the in the sketchbooks for a couple of years, and I keep resketching them. I go out and gather photo references from my travels. And I uh, do color studies on the computer and then create, you know, Photoshop mock-up with the references. And then uh, after all of that, which seems like quite a bit of preliminary work, I, I start painting, creating, building the shape out of wood. I have a assistant who builds them for me, which I'm very grateful for. And then uh, start with an acrylic underpainting to block in the subject matter and then um, spend the majority of the painting working in, in oil paint to kind of achieve that, that hyper-realism detail. So I just got to settle in and put on a podcast or music, and um, that's uh, my, my happy place for sure. Settling in for 1,700 hours. When I read that in your book, that blew my mind. <laughs> like, that oh is my a God. commitment. And I complain about the, some of the writing I have to do with my first drafts. Okay. Um, so Evangeline, I don't know about you. I'm guessing this is the case. One of the things that struck me most was the sort of Old Testament motifs that he talked about. Could you maybe take the reader along for what he was saying? And, and, uh, <laughs> yeah, take the baton yeah. from me there, Evangeline. What, what, do, what did you notice about the Old Testament motifs with them? <laughs> okay, can I just take the baton? Sure. Well, I'll just talk about Harbinger then, because that kind of just slides right in there. Um, I was reading the description of this painting with this owl, which I guess, Josh, came right out of one of your your readings of the Old Testament. You were talking about the book of Isaiah, the destruction hmm. of Babylon, and the description of wild animals inhabiting abandoned cities. So that's right from the, from the text in your book. Um, yeah, in the, the Old Testament, there's... <laughs> there's over and over again the you know the building up and then the destruction or the decline of the nation of Israel and so I love the concept of the owl as that warning and also um of it as a call back and I think that that kind of parallels with our time now we can kind of see the same sort of echoes throughout history and even in our own culture the sort of destruction the decline the strain away from God. And then, you know, the constant call that we can see if we just open our eyes and look at nature, which Josh has done so well to, to kind of remind us of, you know, what our God calls us to and the beauty and the, the creation that's there. And so that, yeah, that's what that brought to mind for me is just the kind of the continual cycle of humans screwing up and then, uh, you know, realizing the beauty that God has given us and, and hopefully, returning. Yeah, that's a great summary of, of the series, Evangeline. <laughs> Thanks. I'm so glad that kind of the themes came through for you. That's really exactly what I was thinking with this painting series. Um, fortunate, uh, aside from painting, I started a uh, bachelor's of religious education in, in arts and uh. biblical studies. So I, I actually just graduated last year after nine years working on it. <laughs> I was so, going to say, you you just have too much time on your hands, don't you? <laughs> I did it I did it very part-time, so uh, yeah. I was able to, to kind of do it on the side with my painting. But to be honest, like, it just provided so much inspiration, and, and I got um, especially interested in, in the prophetic books. You know, mm -hmm. the prophets mm -hmm. are, are such uh, poets, and, you know, they also call out kind of the injustices uh, of their day, and particularly yeah. interested in Isaiah. And uh, a lot of people are familiar with the book of Isaiah, probably more for, you know, the messianic prophecies um, mm -hmm. fulfilled in Christ. But uh, there are these really interesting passages that scholars call, you know, zoological motifs. And uh, it's basically um, like in I Isaiah 13, talks about the hyenas inhabiting Babylon's strongholds. And mm -hmm. basically, it's the concept of nature's reclamation as 
humans are unfaithful to their creator animals are then contrasted um, giving honor and so the title for my painting series came from isaiah 43 which says that the this is isaiah recording the words of god the wild animals honor me the jackals and the owls because i provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland yet you have not called on me jacob you have not wearied yourselves for me israel and that just was a um fascinating concept for me that i thought i could work with and interpret it across vast time periods and how like you said evangeline throughout history we see the development of how empires arise and fall and so in my paintings there are you know abandoned there's abandoned greek temple there are abandoned cathedrals and basically any human institution based on human power ultimately fails and of course you know when we disregard the caring for the earth you know there are devastating effects and there's hints within isaiah about uh you know care for uh creation and so that is really the yeah the inspiration for the painting series yeah. you know and what I, strikes oh, me go, go about ahead, that verse and about your um you know your interpretations is you know that verse pulls no punches and at the same time it turns around and offers provision you know talks about you know the streams in the wasteland which is the perfect title and it I'm just thinking of how difficult it is in art um, to depict real and genuine hope. You know, it's like mm -hmm. conversations that we have kind of often around Anselm is, you know, why does Christian art sometimes fail? And it's often because the hope is not deep enough, not complete enough. It doesn't allow for the devastation, the extent of the destruction that is in our earth, is in our lives. And so it's a struggle to be able mm -hmm. to show real hope. And I think that verse does, and I think your work does. And I think that maybe that's why Matt and I were like, oh my gosh, you know, because you just feel it. Like the ones with, I can't, I don't know if they were, uh, did you say they were killer whales in the river? Mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know. That just like struck me like emotionally. And I just think you can't manufacture that. It comes from, comes from a real place. And so I have gone off on a tangent. Sorry. Oh, but... <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, and there's something else a lot of related to that, that that you both were touching on that I, I found really powerful. I definitely agree with the, the things you mentioned with the, the cassowary piece and the, the killer whale piece. One that really struck me was the one with the, the spotted hyenas in the old West Ghost town. And I, I thought your your text accompanying it was, was really powerful too. Just this this old ghost town as a lot of towns were back in the day, like my, my city where I live right now was founded as a, basically a row of saloons back in the day oh, wow. <laughs> uh, wow. along, a, along a mining route. My street was the bad neighborhood, let's put it, back in the day. Uh, but you have the old west town abandoned and roaming through were all these spotted hyenas, which gets into the surrealist aspect because, spoiler alert, spotted hyenas don't live in, in the American West. <laughs> but it was just so powerful. And again, the theme that you got from Isaiah, it's like, well, humans, you can't praise me. But guess what? The hyenas are praising me. They're doing it. Why can't you? It's sort of this where humans are supposed to have this stewardship role over the earth. But because we're failing in it in this almost prophetic way that it gets being turned on its head, where now now that the hyenas have control of the town, where the people have failed. And I thought that was such a, a powerful thing. And uh, just tell me more about how that sort of theme of stewardship over creation plays in what you've done and how you get that from the Old Testament or, or other sources. Yeah, for sure. And this has been, you know, a theme in a lot of my, my work from the beginning is showing the beauty and wonder of God's creation and its particularity. And I think that's why the style of hyperrealism really lends itself to showing the uh, attention to detail and diversity that I see in the natural world. For me, I was uh, I was mentored under a um, famous wildlife artist, Robert Bateman, who is uh, also a, a naturalist. And when I was 15 years old, and he encouraged me to get into uh, a conservation um, cause and effort near where I live. And so I 
connected with a local conservation area and eventually they asked me to uh, join the board and we do tree plantings and I've been fortunate to donate my art to raise funds for conservation efforts. And I am really happy to partner with people who also have this love and desire for stewardship, whether they are, you know, Christians or not. But over the years, I've really seen throughout scripture how there is a really uh, solid foundation for what is called creation care. So in uh, Genesis 1, 26 to 28, it talks about how you know, Adam and Eve are commanded to have dominion over the natural world. And probably a better translation of that word is, is righteous ruling or servant leadership. In Genesis 2.15, it talks about how uh, they're given the Garden of Eden to take care and steward and, and cultivate it. And so throughout my painting series and in the book, I um, talk about this calling that we have um, to, care, to care for our surroundings. There's some great Christian environmental conservation groups um, out there like Arasha and, and Plant with Purpose that are doing great work. And it's all um, based in hope. And Evangeline, I, I like what you mentioned there because for me, it's not about alarmism or extremism or trying to make something that is fear-based. Um, I found that art has really a unique role in um, grabbing people's affections and their loves and what's not better than animal art for really um, drawing people to care for creatures that sadly are, you know, going extinct um, at such a rapid rate. And there's just uh, terrible issues all around the world. And I want to shine a spotlight on that through my work, whether it be, for instance, the escape artist painting of a, uh, temple elephant in India escaping from its cruel treatment or pandas, for instance, in, in China that are endangered and 99% of their historical range has been depleted and uh, habitat destruction is, is something that's very serious. But I want to also give people hope that uh, there are ways that we can contribute to this. In, in the book, I direct people to various conservation organizations that are doing great work around the world. Can we talk about the liberation of the jackalope painting? Oh, I love that one. It, yeah, it, kind yeah, of, yeah. it kind of fits in this uh, way that we're going for the conversation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I Yeah, that painting is kind of a, a funny one. I'll just kind of help uh, describe it uh, to people. So it's this jackrabbit on a kitchen table with sort of a, a tea party scene. And there's uh, sand dunes that have blown into this ghost town house. And um, I, I called it Liberation of the Jackalope because, of course, you know, probably familiar with the legend of the jackalope <laughs> <laughs> and uh, there's shadows of the jackalope and there's kind of the remains of its antlers and so it was kind of a mystical painting where I was thinking about because I did some research and found out that although it is a legend that it's based in some truth that rabbits sometimes develop this kind of disease that causes them to grow these antler like warts which uh it was quite disturbing um yeah I research it. yeah um, so i wouldn't advise googling it um <laughs> so... google warning <laughs> um so but i was thinking about you know the passage in in romans 8 about the liberation of creation uh which is been groaning and, and looks forward to its restoration. And so what would it mm -hmm. look like for this jackrabbit to be freed from this disease? And so it's it's looking out uh, through the window to um, the dawn of, of a new age. Yeah, I saw this painting and I immediately noticed the shadow with the antlers. And, and my first interpretation was, oh, you know, it's a regular jackrabbit, but, you know, he has dreams of being this other creature. <laughs> and then I read what you wrote about, you know, the animal suffering, which is so compassionate. And you're right, so strong in its appeal to our hearts and to for us to realize and see, you know, the effects of the curse and the effects of our own um, 
disinterest and, and neglect of the environment. And so, you know, I went from this, oh, how cool, a little, you know, a little fantasy, you know, concept to just being punched in the gut and thinking about our own liberation from disease and from from the things that affect us that are were never meant to be. And, you know, we have to go through this world with them and then but the time is coming when we will be perfected and we will, you know, those things will, will pass away. And so, mm-hmm. yeah, it just, to me, just, it captured me and like, you know, stole my imagination and I'm literally like getting emotional about it <laughs> so, mm. over a jackrabbit. <laughs> that that yeah, warms my heart. Thank you for sharing. <laughs> Yeah, and I'll I'll add on um, just sort of my two cents there. First of all, I am so happy to have the jackalopes mentioned because that <laughs> is something we in the American West we love we love our jackalopes dearly. Yes, and um, yes. <laughs> so I've, I've I've loved them since I was a kid. And yeah, what I did something similar to you did, Josh, where I kind of did a deep dive of you know the history of jackalopes. And you come across those pictures of the poor rabbits with the cancerous growth in it. Yeah, again, like. Josh is not kidding, people. Be careful about Googling it. It will mess with you. But it, the, the way you sort of take that aspect of it, that, that you know, it, it could conceivably be a reason why in cultures across the world, there's sort of this legend of rabbits with horns. And you, you sort of take that and turn it. It's such a good picture of the human condition when it's weighed down with sin, where sin becomes this thing that it warps them. It, it sort of gets into all the crevices of us. It takes over our lives and just seeing the the jackrabbit there in the painting with the the horns sort of discarded, it was such a great way to sort of take that legend and sort of twist it into something that that I thought was really profound. So I really appreciated that too. And another painting that I appreciated, and we we've touched about on this already, is the one with the killer whales, the the orcas, sort of swimming out in this river in the middle of the desert. I love orcas dearly. They are <laughs> okay. I'll just put it on the table. You all know what what a nerd I was when I was a kid. But when I was a kid, I would read like every animal book I could get my hands on. And because this is the way my mind worked, I had three different animals. I had a animal favorite animal for the air, a favorite animal for the earth, and a favorite animal for the sea. My favorite sky animal was the peregrine falcon. My favorite earth okay. animal was the wolf. And my favorite okay. sea animal was the orca. I love them to pieces. I think they're the most fascinating creatures in the world. But as you hinted, Josh, there's sort of a dark side to human interaction with orcas, isn't there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I was uh, inspired by this documentary called Blackfish. Yeah. Yeah. Either of you seen it? Yeah. I saw it and it messed me up. Um, Keep keep going. (laughs) It's hard to watch. Yeah. It's. For those who haven't watched it, it kind of uh, catalogs um, whale captivity in uh, uh, marine parks and basically that uh, how whales greatly suffer because of this. They're just um, they need uh, uh, really diverse social interactions and and way more space. And so I uh, was kind of incensed by this and created this painting, um, Peace Like a River, with a pot of orcas um, swimming down the Colorado River, because, you know, of course, that's what you would find in Colorado. (laughs) Um, Sure. (laughs) And so I was thinking about um, back to the streams in the wasteland and just this metaphor that Isaiah uses, which uh, when you see this stream cutting through the barren desert, it's a sign for eschatological hope when justice will will reign in the new heavens and new earth where whales that have suffered due to human captivity will be uh, released out in the wild and so there's it's a, a picture of hope and the title peace like a river is uh you know from the the famous hymn it is well but it's mm-hmm. also um you know, a phrase in the book of Isaiah that's repeated a number of times. And uh, so it, there's a theme of hope and then also, of course, a calling for what can be done in the present. Um, fortunately, there was a bill that was passed here in Canada. It's called the Free Willy Bill. And so it's, <laughs> it's no longer... <laughs> yeah, it's a good name. Uh, it's no longer uh, legal to uh, take any more orcas into captivity in Canada. And uh, 
uh, unfortunately, there's still issues uh, that are still uh, happening in marine parks in Russia and, and China with whales. So there's still work to be done. But uh, yeah, that's kind of the, the meaning behind the painting in a nutshell. Yeah. And again, it, it just goes perfectly into the themes that you've been drawing out in, in the rest of your series, because... What we've done to orcas, to, to killer whales, seems to illustrate this. And, and again, when I saw the Blackfish documentary, it was one of those things where it's like I was convinced. It was like, oh, crap. No, I have to mm. be against this now because, you know, when I was a kid, I, I went to uh, SeaWorld yeah, in too. San Antonio. Me too, yeah. And mm -hmm. I loved Shamu so much. Like, it blew my mind as a kid because, again, I, I think orcas are about the most fascinating creatures on the planet. They're super intelligent. They're social. They're the undisputed kings of the ocean. They have these complex different network of like family groups and like literal cultures, like certain mm -hmm. whales will live in one area and feed on, you know, Sam and other will live like just a few miles down, but they only mm -hmm. eat like sea lions and the, they're so fascinating. But seeing them in this big chlorine tank where they're by themselves, they're not with their family. If they're with another whale, it's from a whale on the other side of the world, like literally like this is a real thing. They're from a different culture, so they don't understand each other, and they're going to be hostile to each other. Mm -hmm. And just seeing them sitting there when they should be just the most powerful kinetic thing uh, in the oceans. And we do this so that people like me can, like, pay our $10 and go, like, ogle the creature. So we're, we're taking our, our role where you said, like, we're, we're stewards of the planet and sort of twisting it around to making one of the most remarkable creatures on the planet suffer for our money and it was like oh no i have to be opposed oh no i have to be opposed to this now so <laughs> that really drove home a, a, uh, yeah. a little crisis i had a few years ago <laughs> no for sure it's it's kind of a double-edged sword because like when i grew up in russia we would see the traveling circuses and zoos uh -huh. and uh, they would always have the animals but they were in such you know uh yep. Yep. small contained containers that yeah, it, it developed in me kind of like this care and concern for, for God's creatures, but at the same time, like an appreciation for the tigers and lions, too. Oh, exactly. Evangeline, I'm guessing you saw this because me and you seem to approach things similar. T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland themes in, in the art, right? I, embarrassingly, am not a good T.S. Eliot uh, scholar. So you will have to take this one. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll be sending you some assigned reading after this. All uh, right. But, I will take it. I'm but, yeah. I'm into poets lately. <laughs> okay. Good. Good. I expect my syllabus by the first of the week. But uh, <laughs> right. but Josh, you, you mentioned in again in your introduction to the poems how T. S. Eliot's poem "The Wasteland" plays into this, and just reading some of the passages, it it seems to like you and T. S. Eliot seem to be getting. You're very much on the same page, right? You're on the same wavelength there. Yeah, I'm glad that you see that. Um, you know, it's funny because I came across uh, his his poem, uh, The Wasteland, um, after I had begun the series. But then the more I kept reading it, the more I realized, wow, this really complements the my project and really talks about, you know, the alienation and despair that he was experiencing and many others in post-World War One Europe, um, where basically you know, civilizations were, were falling. And so that theme is found in my, my paintings. And so, yeah, it was um, something that I wanted to write about in the uh, synopsis of the book and um, really uh, talk about, you know, the wasteland that we find ourselves in. And you can see in my paintings, lots of abandoned uh, ruins, which are kind mm -hmm. of, um, you know, symbolic of that. Yeah. And something else you mentioned in your book that I think is a really cool element as well. You are not the only artist in your family. Your your brother is a composer, and he set each of your paintings to music, apparently. So tell me the process of that and the best way to really make the most out of both the composition and, and the painting. Yeah, so along with the, the book comes with an original soundtrack album. So my brother is a musician and composer. And so I pitched this idea to him last fall. Uh, why not um, try to compose a, a unique track for each painting in the book? And so it was a big ask for sure. <laughs> but uh, he was uh, looking forward to it. He had been studying um, film scoring at UCLA 
and so was was keen on doing a project that was kind of a a thematic uh work so there are 17 tracks and basically they span a a huge variety of of genres uh he's tried to match the the geographic locations um they're kind of asian sounding uh compositions and some more western sounding classical uh the very atmospheric uh, tracks and so the idea is basically uh, while you're looking at the paintings you can listen to the music inspired by each work and so it's a, yeah it's a, a, an interdisciplinary project that I think people will find interesting and so it was fun to to collaborate with him and he also collaborated with 18 musicians all around the world um, who recorded all sorts of different kind of instruments, like the cello. Um, I know there was a guy in Israel who was recording while the bombs were flying over his head. Oh, God. Um, oh, my gosh. And, and someone in Japan who was recording during an earthquake. So uh, it's crazy this whole project um, happened during quite a tumultuous time around the world. Um, but uh, we are very thrilled to be able to work together and uh, collaborate in this way. It's amazing that your project, that, you know, the process of making it uh, mirrors the subject matter. You mm. know, sometimes that, you know, it's like goosebump moments thinking about, you know, our world reflecting that wasteland that you are, you know, showing as redeemed and your art redeems, you know, the suffering and the devastation that was going on as it was being made. Mm -hmm. Yeah, de definitely. And I know people have even said that my paintings have reminded them of some scenes that went around in the, the news during the, the lockdowns. Um, mm. There yeah, were reports yeah. of animals actually out in urban areas, like there was this wild hog running down an Arizona street. <laughs> and uh, there, there are these videos you can see online, but it's kind of a you know, experts have called it this anthropause where, you know, less uh, mobility for, for humans has kind of benefited the, the animal world, but also in a funny way made my paintings uh, seem a little bit more believable, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> more no. pertinent. <laughs> and... Absolutely. Now, I will say I'm glad you mentioned that because that sort of popped into my head when I was reading it too. It's like, oh, I remember seeing some like little photos circulating Twitter on lockdown for this. So yeah, absolutely. And so we're we're running low on time, but before we go, I wanted to talk about uh, the, the painting. It really seems like the capstone painting of the collection, where you sort of bring back all the different animals that you had throughout your your paintings, and you sort of bring them together in one one giant painting. So maybe if you could describe that and the, mm -hmm. the thought behind it. Yeah, for sure. So this painting uh, entitled Agnes Dei, which is Latin for Lamb of God, was a work that I completed during the uh, pandemic. And uh, people who have seen it have really resonated with it as this has been a, a hard time for many people around the world, but uh, that there's a lot of hope in the painting. So Basically, uh, within the work, all of the animals from the other paintings in my series come back for, for one last uh, final call. And they are all surrounding um, the slain lamb in the center. And so this was inspired by uh, the passage in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 53, that is a prophecy for Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. And so this is a familiar passage to many Christians, but what I wanted to do with this painting is um, kind of riff on the historical context where, you know, artists like Jan van Eyck and André Zerberen have um, mm -hmm. depicted the, the Lamb of God motif. But I wanted to extend the meaning to how Christ's substitutionary death on the cross has cosmic scope and an impact for the natural world as well because you know in in scripture we read about uh, the hope of a, a new heavens and the new earth of, of redemption and so i believe that this extends to the animal world isaiah talks about the l wolf will live with the lamb and there will be this peace between humans and animals and so 
these were some of the, the themes kind of in my mind. Also in the painting, I should mention uh, there are these Gothic cathedral ruins that are kind of crumbling. And so it's sort of uh, reflecting sort of the post-Christian societal context that we find ourselves in that is, you know, come about through kind of spiritual compromise. And I was also thinking about, you know, how uh, Christian sacred sites have also been Uh, destroyed by extremist groups. And so there are yeah, a whole bunch of ideas kind of swirling around in my mind. But the main theme was about the reconciliation with the natural world, with creation, which is a future hope, but it's also something that we can live out in the present. There's this author, theologian, animal theologian, Andrew Lindsay, who talks about seeing the crucified in the faces of all suffering creatures. And so this was something that I, I was really moved to depict um, through this painting. Wow, I love that. I'm, now I'm kind of disappointed we never got to even touch on, except for just now, the, the, your use of Gothic architecture. We'll have to have you back. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love architecture, especially Gothic. Well, yes. yeah, I mean, oh, oh man, Vance, now I'm thinking like, oh, there's all these other things we need to talk about too, just right? your, your, your use of different architectural styles from around... Ah, whatever. Let's just do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. Talk about the different architecture styles you incorporate. You have <laughs> Gothic, you have like the stuff from like India, um, China. <laughs> so talk about the, the different gar gar um, architectural styles and uh, how they, they serve the, the message of your paintings. Uh, yeah. So like I mentioned, um, I love, you know, Gothic architecture and its relation to nature. I, I know John Ruskin has, has written mm -hmm. about that quite a bit. But in my paintings, I, I love different uh, international cultures. So there are, uh, in my painting of the elephant, there's a Hindu temple. Um, in the painting Brother Wolf, there is a minaret, the Mughal Empire, Islamic uh, architecture, and I uh, have lots of old Western ghost town, kind of Victorian architecture, and, and even Baroque. And so I really wanted to, you know, the funny thing is with my paintings, um, there are hardly any humans with the exception of, of one painting, but I wanted to, again, it was this interplay with uh, the natural world reclaiming this architecture, which which is beautiful. I don't want to uh, gloss over, but that eventually uh, fades away. And just the, mm -hmm. the power of nature, of creation over, um, you know, man-made structures, I think should ultimately humble us and um, cause us to turn to the creator. So that's the kind of the, the impetus behind the architecture. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Well, I... I'm glad we, we took the architecture detour, Evangeline. Definitely worthwhile. Um, yes. One thing I wanted to do, just in closing, because the thing that kept rattling through my head as I was, I was reading this was the poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, God's Grandeur. He is probably my favorite poet ever, and he was a, uh, he was a Catholic priest. Uh, he wrote a lot of great religious poems. He also wrote a lot of great nature poems. And if you guys will will humor me for a bit. I do not have the poem reading voice that maybe I should for this, but I would love to read it because I think it touches on the exact same themes you're trying to get at at your artwork um, with Streams in the Desert. So here we go. The world is charged with the grandeur of God. It will flame out like shining from shook foil. It gathers to a greatness like the ooze of oil crushed. Why do men then now not wreck his rod? Generations have trod, have trod, have trod. And all is seared with trade, bleared, smeared with toil. And wears man's smudge and shares man's smell. The soil is bare now, nor can foot feel being shod. And for all this, nature is never spent. There lives the dearest freshness deep down things. And though the last lights of the black west went, O oh morning, at the brown brink eastward spring, because the Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe, bright wings so again mm. Gerard Manley Hopkins uh, for the win yeah it's beautiful thanks for sharing and, that oh absolutely believe me it was my pleasure um <laughs> so Josh thank you so much for joining us here uh, on the podcast and again where can we find your work where can we get everyone to buy your book uh, where can we find you 
Uh, yeah, you can, um, I'm on social media, um, uh, Instagram is one that I'm pretty active on at Josh Tyson, T I E S S E N. And my, my website, Josh com is the best place where you can get all the info about the uh, book. It's a, uh, hardcover coffee table book, um, full color, and, uh, it's great for, a gift and uh, anyone who has appreciation for art or is a, a deep thinker or who loves the natural world and also uh, would enjoy the musical accompaniment i think this would make a great uh, keepsake so uh, yeah feel free to uh, check it out there's more images of the book and uh, information there you awesome. want this book <laughs> yes you believe me guys you do you do this is so good and josh thank you once again and as you all can tell things are winding down at the anselm digital pub the fire's down to embers the customers are trundling home and you've polished off your final glass once again believe to see is a podcast of the anselm society please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts thank you all for joining us and we'll see you next time <laughs>